We are so thankful you have chosen to spend some of your time with us to continue learning from the collective knowledge of our NYU community. Today's guest lecturer is Lloyd Cambridge. He earned his bachelor's in economics from NYU and is an alumnus of the Coro New York Leadership Center. Lloyd is the founder and CEO of Progress Playbook, a small business training and economic development consulting company. He partners with government agencies, nonprofits, and small businesses nationally to design customized learning experiences and inclusive growth strategies that support entrepreneurs and starting and scaling businesses. Progress Playbook's clients include the New York Department of Small Business Services, City Harvest, Brooklyn Children's Museum, the Actors Fund, and the New York City Housing Authority. Lloyd, at this time, I'll pass it over to you. Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Valerie, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, and it's good to see everybody on the call today. Um, it's a small group, uh, so maybe we could start if you guys are all around the table with a quick uh, just introduction, uh, just maybe say your name um, and maybe what's one thing that brought you here today. So I'm gonna uh, start with Matthew, if you can hear me, Matthew. Hey everyone, Matthew Chang, a recent graduate uh, class of 2021. I guess I'm interested in just learning, uh, going into grad school and you know working with internships and co-ops of uh, you know better stewarding uh, that money and how to even save uh, before I even get to my first job. Nice, nice. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Ravi, Rajvi. Oh, hi, I'm Rajvi, and I am a recent grad from NYU Tandon. Uh, I'll be joining my first company, which is Barclays, and I'm in, interested in understanding uh, how to manage personal finance before starting the job. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Johnson. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I am a graduate of uh, class of 2020 from the College of Arts and Science. Um, I was originally going to grad school, but I figured that full-time job is a better option for a better option for me. So I'm starting in actually in two weeks. So I'm interested in learning more about you know how taxes work, um, you know what percent should go to four four one k and things like that. So really just to how to manage my like the title says how to manage my first salary. Thank you. Thank you, Johnson. And lastly, we have uh, Diana. Hi, so my name is Diana. I also just graduated from SPS in integrated marketing. I'm doing, again, like my first job in the city and I just want to learn more about money and like finances. How do you really handle money? I've never really saved. So yeah, just a general knowledge, I guess. And taxes as well would be like important to know. Nice, awesome. Well, thank you, Diana. Thank you, everybody. Um, Awesome, so I'm gonna get the presentation started. Just, I'm gonna share my screen with you all. And congratulations on graduating recently. I remember when I graduated way back in the day, um, <laughs> uh, back in 2004. Can you guys see my screen? Can you guys see my screen or no? Yeah? Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna get this started here. I am going to get this started. But yeah, when I graduated, uh, definitely had a lot of fun at NYU um, and was looking forward to graduating so I could start making money. <laughs> um, and my first job out of college was at JP Morgan Chase, uh, where I was a credit analyst working with um, apparel, textile, and jewelry companies. We funded apparel, textile, and jewelry companies. I think I made, I don't remember, maybe uh, this is in 2004, maybe uh, 60,000 a year, some, some, something around there. Um, and definitely a challenge in terms of knowing how to be able to manage that. But uh, I'm gonna dive into that in a, in a, 
in more detail in a second. Um, awesome. So you may be you may have a lot of different questions. Uh, we heard some today, and uh, in, in, in those intros from how do I create a budget to how can I reduce my expenses? How important is it? How important is an emergency fund? Uh, when should I start saving for retirement? How do I manage my loan repayments in the face of uh, financial instability? And then ultimately, right, we all want to make more money, right? So these are some of the questions that we're going to dive into a little bit um, and, and other things. So before we get started, this is me uh, <laughs> as a young person um, and, and my two sisters. I grew up in the 80s in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Um, as a young person growing up in Brownsville, I always, um, you know, I grew up in a single family household, um, a, a smart student, a smart guy, uh, but, you know, uh, Growing up in that in my household, you know, we my mom, I would say, she did the best that she could, right, in terms of being able to manage money. Um, and I think that my relationship with money um, at that time was a little skewed, um, you know, and, and and that was one of the impetuses in terms of me wanting to start a business. I wanted to start a business from, from a very young age because I felt at the time that I had lacked. You know, I wanted to be like that cool kid uh, <laughs> growing up and have, you know, nice clothes and sneakers and all those things. Um, and I thought that entrepreneurship at a very young age was the way for me to be able to get there. Uh, so kind of fast forward. Again, I, I um, went to Canarsie High Schools. I actually studied engineering at, you know, at Canarsie High School. But and when I went to NYU, I was kind of undecided if I was going to be computer science major or um, study business. I wound up studying economics at NYU. Um, and like I said, I worked for uh, JP Morgan Chase. That was my first job outside of college. Um, and then went on to work for um, a government agency here in New York uh, called the Department of Small Business Services, managing two of their business service centers. So uh, when I first graduated and I got my first salary of about $60,000, I believe, um, you know, I was a novice, uh, didn't know a lot about financial literacy, uh, but one of the things that I that I did was I really studied and I educated myself on this topic a lot um, and then wound up teaching classes uh, to adults and young people on financial literacy. Um, so again, this is me, uh, NYU grad 2004. My past life is a banker and public servant. I curr I'm currently the founder of Progress Playbook. I do a lot of teaching, and for those that are interested, I love Sour Patch Kids. I know I'm not the only one. Uh, awesome. So, ah. so let's start here. I actually pulled this um, news article that I saw, and it said that 60% of millennials earning over $100,000 say they're living paycheck to paycheck. That's a big number, right? 60% of millennials. Uh, earning over $100,000. $100,000 is a lot of money, <laughs> right? So imagine making a, over $100,000 coming outside of college, or maybe you're making a little bit less. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, this stat is essentially saying that, you know, uh, six out of 10 people uh, who are millennials are, are living paycheck to paycheck. And that's not a fun or great place to live in. Um, they say that six figure earners who struggle, uh, they essentially struggle to balance their spending and their saving habits. Uh, they fall victim to lifestyle creep. Um, so that's essentially trying to keep up with the Joneses, right? Um, so as their discretionary income increases, their lifestyle increases as well. Um, and they prefer a comfortable and often expensive lifestyle that leaves them le um, living paycheck to paycheck. Um, so this is what I do not want for anybody on this call is to be a part of this statistic here. Um, I took a look at um, some of the consumption uh, spending patterns of, of Gen Z um, and compared it to, um, and they compared it in this chart to other generations. Um, and you'll see here, like Gen Z has, they're, they're, they're spending, they have way more transactions than other generations, whether it's millennials or Gen X, boomers or silence uh, at about 358 um, <clears throat> transactions. Um, and even in terms of the, the dollar amount, the average transaction um, is pretty high as well at about $58.30 and uh, compared to millennials who are about $54.91. Um, so I think that we're in this culture of, uh, you know, 
really keeping up with the Joneses and it's largely, I believe, uh, due to social media and other factors um, as well. But I think social media has a big uh, place in this. And, and when I looked at uh, how Gen Z is actually, you know, in terms of their monthly expenditures, where's, where are their money, where's the money going, <laughs> right? 53% um, to clothes and shoes, eating out, groceries, personal care, video games, um, and then events. Can anyone on the call relate to any of this here? Where would you say most of your money is going to? Which category? For me, probably eating out. Eating out, yeah, it's a big one. All right, Diana, anybody else? So I would say when I first graduated, I would say clothes and eating out was probably two of the largest expenditures that I had when I first graduated, right? So um, essentially what, what's happening here, these are all habits, right? Um, so we learn habits through culture, from our family, through our friends, uh, through media. There are a lot of different uh, avenues um, in terms of how we're learning um, and the habits that we're developing as it relates to money and other things, right? So people do not decide their futures. They decide their habits and their habits decide their futures, right? So I think that habits sometimes are even more important than uh, goals, right? Because you can have a goal. Let's think about setting an intention or a goal at the end of the year or at the top of the year. Um, I want to lose weight, or I want to gain weight, or I want to buy a house, or go on vacation, whatever it is, right? Uh, we we can all have these goals, but in terms of you know being able to accomplish those things, it's really about having healthy habits, right? So today we're going to talk a little bit more about creating um, healthy financial habits that will allow you to create the future um, that in which you are looking to create. So. Um, a budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. So many of you spoke a little bit about uh, wanting to know how to budget your money some. So your primary goal when it comes to budgeting um, is to keep your spending beneath your income, right? Um, so I'm gonna give you guys just six tips here. Um, so the first one I would say is to pay yourself first. Take a percentage off the top. So if you're making, um, you know, $3,000 a month, um, you want to decide and commit to and build the habit of uh, setting aside a certain portion of your paycheck every period towards savings. Um, so what I do is I set it on and this is uh, actually it's not on here, but setting up an automatic savings, um, you know, where every single pay period you have money essentially just coming out of your account. Um, so again, you want to develop these healthy habits because your habits will determine your future, right? So one of those habits is really, uh, setting aside money at every single pay period. Um, you know, uh, some of the gurus say, you know, anywhere between 10 to 20%, um, although the gurus say that, you know, I'm, you know, uh, everybody's financial condition is a little bit different. Um, so even if it's 1% or 2%, right, uh, the goal is to develop the habit um, and then even if you start off with 1%, you can begin to increase that over time, right? But the very first thing you wanna do when you get paid is to put aside money um, into uh, uh, interest bearing savings account. You wanna pay yourself first, right? So you don't wanna pay your bills first and then pay yourself last. You wanna pay yourself first and then pay your bills uh, as a second, you know, uh, that would be the secondary thing that you would do. Um, you also want to identify your monthly living expenses and your income as well. Um, so everyone needs to know on this call, how much money does it take for me to live on a, on a monthly basis? So you want to get a spreadsheet and break down, you know, I'm paying X number of dollars for rent or mortgage. I'm paying X number of dollars for utilities, for student loan payments, um, for entertainment, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you want to know what that number is. Maybe for you it's 2,000, it could be 3,000 or upward of 3,000, but you definitely wanna know how much money does it cost for you to live every single month. Um, and then obviously you wanna know what your income is um, and then you wanna put that into some type of um, 
uh, an Excel tool or some type of a budgeting tool, I actually use a tool called Mint. And that's where we look at uh, step number five here is to track your spending. Mint and other applications really are great tools. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, but Mint.com is a great app that allows, that connects to all of your uh, checking accounts, all of your savings accounts, your credit cards, your loans, et cetera. You can get a, a really uh, a financial picture literally uh, every day of where you are and even in terms of your credit. Um, so definitely setting up a budget will be helpful and utilizing uh, an app like mint.com uh, will support you in that. Um, so we don't wanna be like some of the millennials who are making uh, or living paycheck to paycheck, right? That's 60% and many of them are living above their means um, largely because they want to have a certain type of lifestyle. Right. So the very, you know, so the third thing here is really to identify areas where you can begin to cut back. So once you have a list of your kind of monthly expenses, um, you know, you want to look at that regularly and say, well, where, where are there opportunities on this list for me to begin to reduce my expenses? All right. This is something that I just did maybe about a week ago, actually. Um, I was paying for, you know, uh, certain subscriptions. For example, I had an app called Scribd. Uh, that allowed me to have unlimited books and magazines, but I was never using the app. I was paying about $9 a month for the app. Um, so I canceled that subscription so I can save that $9, right? Um, I also looked at my Verizon bill. Um, and if I set up automatic payments with Verizon, who's my cell phone provider, uh, they provided me with um, Apple Music for free. I know that I cannot live without music, really important to me. Um, <laughs> so I wasn't gonna cut off Apple, but you know, so what I decided to do was actually set up the automatic payment with uh, Verizon so that I can get access to uh, free Apple Music for the duration of uh, as, as long as I essentially stay with Verizon, right? So there are little things that you can begin to do to decrease your expenses. So I would say on a regular basis, uh, at least annually, you want to take a look at your expenses and say, hey, where are there opportunities for me to be able to cut my expenses? And sometimes it's you know, simply making a phone call or doing research um, uh, to some of your vendors or some of the people that you're actually paying money to, some of, you know, uh, whether it's subscriptions, your landlord, your credit card companies, um, et cetera, and see if there are ways for you to begin to reduce some of your expenses, All right? So again, we're, we don't want to be a part of that statistic where we're spending more money than what we're earning, right? Um, and we can accomplish that if we do these regular audits. Um, I'm trying to think if I did anything else. Uh, I was paying for website hosting uh, for uh, uh, other business ideas that I had. So uh, website hosting is like where you essentially buy like a URL. Uh, these are things that I purchased years ago and I was paying for it every single uh, every single year to keep those URLs up to date. Um, and I decided, you know, I'm, these are things that I'm not using, right? Um, so when you're looking at your expenses, think about, well, am I actually using this thing? And if not, uh, those are things that you may want to consider cutting. Um, there's another, there's, there's a rule called uh, the 50, 30, 20 rule. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, different ways that in which you can approach budgeting, but one of them is this 50, 30, 20 rule where you where 50% of your money goes towards what you need, uh, rent, mortgage, uh, lights, food, et cetera. 30% um, goes towards um, your, your wants, right? So that might be clothes and certain subscriptions um, or entertainment, you know, certain types of personal care. Uh, so, you know, uh, historically I used to get a haircut every single week. Uh, but now, you know, I know that I don't need a haircut every single week, especially, you know, uh, during COVID and post COVID. So now I've kind of reduced the number of haircuts that I'm getting um, down to two times a month versus on a weekly basis. Um, and then the last 20% here is going towards your financial goals. All right. Um, again, you want to track your spending. Um, you can utilize an app like mint.com. It's a great app. It's free, costs you literally nothing uh, to sign up and you can see your financial condition. Literally, uh, I look at mine every single day. I monitor my credit. Um, I monitor my spending habits. Um, and I also look at my net worth to kind of see how much I'm worth. Uh, and that's something for me, it's like a game and it's a little fun. 
Um, I don't know if you would have the same kind of passion towards it, but at least on a weekly basis, you want to sit, sit down with yourself and just look at your, um, look at your budget, right? Um, um, and again, to see if you are going over certain categories and in which you shouldn't be going over. Um, and if so, uh, creating um, and setting certain boundaries. Um, and then the last one is figuring out ways to boost your income. There's another stat that I saw. So as you're kind of venturing into your new jobs, I thought this is a pretty interesting stat here that says that research shows that not negotiating your salary could cost you a million dollars, especially for women, right? So negotiation uh, as you're entering into your new job is really, really important. Uh, it can make the difference between you make uh, be between you making a million dollars over the life of your career, right? Here's a here's a quick example here. Um, if somebody has a job offer that was made, um, you know, Jim, he accepts uh, $45,000 and he receives a 1% raise each year. Um, you know, uh, Jane, she received the same job offer, but she negotiates $50,000 um, up essentially. So she's making $5,000 more than Jim. Uh, and she also receives a four, uh, sorry, a 1% raise yearly. And then she negotiates a 4% raise every three years, right? If everything else kind of remains the same and we, you know, um, go out uh, several years, um, yeah, Jane will have $43,616 more in uh, her income uh, than what Jim is making, right? Even within the first five years, the income gap is also large where Jane is making uh, about $7,000 more than what Jim is making. So. Part of budgeting is not only your expenses, but is also your income as well, right? So a negotiation is a great tool, it's a skill that you can use on the job to be able to essentially make a um, million dollars according to this article and these statistics over the life of your career, right? So I would um, advise everyone to uh, definitely see if you can negotiate, it doesn't hurt to ask. I would get some advice on how to how to position yourself to be able to do that, even when you get that initial offering. All right, so, all right. Um, so in terms of your budget, um, you know, you can also look at your budget. I know I told you guys the 50, 30, 20 rule. Um, there's some basic kind of baseline percentages in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of you know, how you should be spending your money based on various categories, right? So housing should typically make up 25 to 35% of your budget. That will make up most, that will take up most of your income, obviously. Um, then you wanna look at things like insurance and food, and you, you can kind of read this from here, but um, I would also just look at percentages and say, hey, am I in alignment with uh, the industry standard, right? Or the standard for, um, based off of the experts in terms of what they're saying. Am I in alignment with those percentages? Um, and when you utilize apps, again, like mint.com, you can also break it down by percentages to see, well, this month I spent 35% on going out. Um, and that's way above um, what the you know, expectation is in terms of percentage. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is is uh, the time value of money. So the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. So all of you guys are really young. Uh, so time is definitely on your side. We're gonna take a look at two different scenarios here. First scenario, we have um, someone starting early at the age of 20 and then someone else starting at the age of 40. And this is all about saving your money, right? So it pays to save early, start now. Uh, I, if you don't get anything from this talk is to start saving early, to start saving now. Um, so the 20 year old, she initially deposits $200 into her account. Um, she makes $50 monthly contributions um, and there's an interest rate of about 2%, right? Um, so her total investment is $24,000. At the age of 60, she makes $37,166.59. Um, in the second scenario, all right, so if you started 20 years later, you waited till you're 40 years old to kind of get started with saving, um, you know, she 
tries to catch up here, right? And she invests $30,000, sorry, $3,000, and she invests uh, $100 into her savings account on a monthly basis with a 2% interest. So her total investment here is 27,000, but she only makes, if all things remain the same or equal, um, she only makes $33,953, right? So you see the difference. Um, and this is what we call compounding interest, right? That's where as you invest your money, um, you essentially reinvest your, your, uh, the, the interest that you're making on the money that, that in which you're saving, right? And then it begins to compound and if what we call exponential growth begins to happen. Um, so it definitely pays to start early. I'm not gonna show you guys the video that I have here for an interest of time, uh, but you know, what I want you to take away here is that it pays to start early. And I hope that example here highlighted that. Um, so do not save what is left after spending, but spend what is left after spend, after saving, right? And that's by Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, I think number three or number four. Uh, so if you're going to take advice from anyone, uh, you definitely want to take advice from uh, someone who is one of the richest people in the world. Um, so the second habit, so the first habit that you want to develop, right, because our habits really determine our future. This first habit is all about budgeting, right? That's something that I want to look at monthly, sorry, weekly. I want to sit down um, and budget my, um, my income and my expenses on a, on a weekly basis. You're going to utilize apps like mint.com. You're going to figure out ways to reduce your expenses. And you want to do that at least on an annual basis. Those little fees, uh, subscription fees, and um, you know, uh, you know uh, I have Netflix, um, but I, you know, I have several friends, so I'm using like their Disney Plus uh, or I'm using their Hulu. I'm not paying for those things. I'm leveraging my network um, to be able to reduce my expenses. So find those little things that you can begin to do to decrease your expenses. Um, and don't forget about uh, increasing your income as well. And there's a ton of ways to do that. But one of the ways in which you're going to be able to make a million dollars literally of the life of your career is through negotiation, right? So the first habit is all about budgeting. Second habit is about saving, right? So we just learned that if I start saving early, it will make one big difference, right? Versus if I started saving 20 years later, right? So you don't want to wait till you're 40. Uh, you guys are, I'm assuming, in your 20s or early 30s. Um, so you want to start saving as soon as possible. So one of the first things you want to do is to determine how much of your paycheck you should be saving. We spoke about this earlier. Uh, I'm going to keep highlighting this. Uh, you're going to pay yourself first. Um, so even if it's a dollar, I don't care if it's a dollar, what you want to do is you want to build the habit of saving, right? Um, and then over time, you want to begin to increase that number, right? You also want to define your savings goals to begin to gain momentum. Um, one of your first financial goals is to have an emergency fund. Um, I would start off with $1,000 in my emergency fund. I would make that my primary goal um, is, is to have an emergency fund. An emergency fund, um, if there is an unexpected event that happens, if you lose your job, for example, or if you have a medical uh, condition that needs, you know, uh, that, that you would have to pay out or anything can happen, right? So you want to have some money essentially set aside um, and I would definitely start with $1,000 and then kind of increase that over time. Some of the experts say that you want to have at least six months of your living expenses saved in, in, in an emergency account. It's a big number, right? <laughs> so um, if, it, if, it, you know, if it costs you $1,000 to live every single month, uh, that's, you have to save $6,000 essentially, right? So I'm, I'm saying here that you want to start off with 1000 um, and then eventually kind of, you know, begin to continue to build your savings um, until you get to that six months, right? But don't feel um, that you're not doing the right thing because you don't have six months saved um, in an emergency fund. Again, you want to use automation to make saving a habit. Again, habits determine your future. So starting early with saving and making it automatic where you don't even have to think about it, um, you will be very grateful uh, <laughs> over the years. Uh, if you start this super early. Also, you want to choose a high yield savings account as well. Some of the internet banks actually have higher yields or high, higher interest rates um, than uh, some of the banks that we might be used to, like Chase and Citibank, et cetera. 
Um, so I would begin to look at some of the online banks uh, because they actually offer higher interest rates than uh, some of the tra tra traditional banks that we that we know about. I want to go back to two really quickly. Um, you're going to establish these goals. Again, your first goal should be having this emergency fund because you want to protect yourself. Um, you know, but maybe you have other goals, right? Maybe you want to buy a house in 10 years. Maybe you want to um, buy a car or maybe you want to plan for a vacation. Whatever your goals are, you want to set up like separate savings accounts uh, for each of your goals, right? So you don't want to save all of the money into like one account. So for each of my goals, I have about five goals right now. Um, I have a separate account under one online bank uh, and each of those accounts, and it's free to set up, uh, but under each of those accounts, I have uh, a separate, I have a separate savings account um, under this one umbrella. Um, and I save automatically, you know, whether it's $20 or $50 or $100 that goes into each of those accounts. Um, but obviously you want to determine how much money you need to save in order to be able to accomplish that goal. And then kind of from there work backwards. Fifth step here is to keep retirement in mind. We're going to talk more about that in a second. Um, and then you want to address your saving strategy as your career flourishes, right? So the second habit, again, is to build, um, uh, it's to build your accounts. It's, and you're going to do that through savings. Um, you also want to keep in mind um, saving for retirement. You guys are really young right now. Um, I know some 45-year-olds that are retired. Um, uh, so when do you want to retire? That's a great question. Do you want to work until you're 65? Um, and if you don't want to work until you're 65, maybe you want to retire at 45, maybe you want to retire over the next 25 years. Um, and that's a realistic goal that you can achieve um, if you start now, right? So one of the ways that in which you can do that is to take advantage of your employer's uh, 401k plan. Um, at the minimum, you know, you want to find out if your employer uh, offers um, a match. So essentially um, through the 401k programs, most employers will match you dollar for dollar up into a certain amount, right? So um, at the minimum, you want to invest money into your 401k up until the match, right? So if your employer says, hey, for every $5 that you put in, we'll match you $5, right? It's gonna be more than $5, obviously. Uh, but you want to take advantage of that, of those, uh, that's essentially free money, right? So you want to take advantage of free money. I'm not going to turn down any free money. <laughs> um, and the benefits of the 401k, um, again, you know, um, it has a lot of uh, tax benefits as well. Um, there's another type of retirement account called a Roth IRA. Um, and the tax benefits to the Roth IRA is that it essentially allows you to kind of defer your taxes. So the Roth IRA is another retirement vehicle that you can choose uh, that can allow you to save for retirement. Um, and you can uh, invest up into seven, up to $7,000 annually. Uh, and those numbers change year by year, but right now the number is $7,000. Again, you wanna make your uh, automatic contributions Number four, once you've uh, started saving, make sure you, you're putting that money to work in stocks. If we have more time, we can talk about um, uh, uh, you know, diversifying your portfolio. But what I would do is really talk to a financial professional when it comes to your 401k and your Roth IRAs uh, to help you to determine where that money should be going inside of your portfolio, right? So you wanna identify like what your risk tolerance is. So you guys are really young right now. So you can stand, um, you can take on more risk as a young person. So you may want to be a little bit more aggressive uh, with your 401k and your uh, Roth IRA. So when I say aggressive, right, um, you're going to invest that money in your 401k and your Roth IRAs. You're investing that money into either stocks or bonds. Uh, and there are different classes of stocks. There's different classes of bonds. Some are more riskier than others. Um, so as a young person, right? And um, again, you can tolerate a little bit more risk. So you may wanna be a little bit more aggressive um, in terms of where you're allocating those dollars inside of your retirement accounts. Um, you, you, know, you definitely wanna avoid early withdrawals uh, because there are tax implications if you begin to 
um, invest in your 401k or an IRA. There are actually two different types of IRAs. There's a Roth IRA and then there's a traditional IRA. So the Roth IRA is actually after taxes. So you're, you're investing money into a retirement, a retirement account after you pay taxes where the Roth IRA, that's my time, okay? <laughs> where the Roth IRA is uh, before taxes. So the reason why you wanna do a Roth IRA versus a traditional IRA is because um, a Roth IRA, you know, if we think out, you know, 40 years, the tax rate will probably more than likely be a lot higher than what it is right now. Um, so the Roth IRA, you're paying taxes on the forefront. Um, and in the next 40, you know, 30, 40 years, um, you won't have to pay taxes on the money that you've invested inside of that account, right? Um, and we can anticipate that the tax rate will be a lot higher because of what's happening in the country right now in terms of the national debt. Um, so number five, again, you want to uh, avoid any early withdrawals. If you withdraw money from your 401k, especially, um, you will be hit with a 20% um, uh, tax penalty. Um, you can borrow money against your IRA and then begin to pay yourself, sorry, your, your Roth or your, sorry, your IRA or your 401k, you can borrow money against it. So if you wanted to, for example, buy a home um, and you wanted to use some of your retirement money uh, to, to be able to do that, you can, um, you'll be paying yourself back uh, plus interest. Um, and then number six, again, is to build your emergency fund, right? And the, one of the other benefits of having the emergency fund is that you don't want to rely on what tends to happen is some people rely on their, their uh, retirement accounts when there's an emergency. Um, and that's what you don't want to do, right? You don't want to tap into your 401k, tap into your IRA when there's an emergency. You want to have a separate account set aside uh, for those purposes. So you won't have to um, have those tax implications if you pull money out of those accounts. Um, this is another graph, uh, but for sake of time, I'm not going to go through it, but this is just another graph here, just kind of showing the value of starting to invest in your retirement accounts early. Uh, so if you just look at the blue line, that's somebody starting at the age of 25, uh, the red starting at the age of 30 and somebody else starting at the age of 35, uh, you'll see that the winner here, um, is the person that started really early. Uh, at the age of 25, making 638,000 versus 397,000, um, um, you know, at the end of their career. All right, so uh, here's an equation worth remembering: five dollars earned minus seven dollars spent equals an unhappy life. <laughs> I kind of like this quote. I think it's kind of cute. Um, so managing your debt would be another habit, right? So the first habit is all about budgeting. The second habit is all about saving. This third habit is about managing debt. There's good and there's bad debt. Many of us have taken out student loans. I've paid mine back several years ago, thank God. Uh, but managing your debt is definitely a habit that you wanna build. Um, if you look here, engineering majors um, have a, uh, on average a debt of about $89,000, but the average student loan debt is, uh, is about $37,000. So when it comes to managing your student loans and paying that off, um, you want to consider refinancing or consolidating loans to lower your monthly payment, right? So that's essentially going to other lenders to see if you can um, get uh, a lower interest rate, or maybe you have several student loans and you want to consolidate those loans into one. Um, that's another way then in which you can save money and begin to have you know, more income to save or to invest. Um, you want to make additional payments. Uh, you, know, you can make those payments, those additional payments maybe bi-weekly. So as opposed to just paying monthly, um, you know, uh, you can pay your loan off a lot faster if you begin to make payments um, on a more frequent basis, obviously. You can also sign up for automatic payments to earn an interest rate reduction by around 0.25%. Uh, so I would, you know, it, again, very similar to what I did with Verizon and I was able to get access to uh, free Apple Music um, you know, uh, on the student loan side, if you set up automatic payments, um, you can sometimes get a reduction in your interest rate. Again, saving money so that you can allocate those dollars somewhere else. Uh, you want to take advantage of tax deductions. So when you're doing your taxes on an annual basis, you can um, deduct the interest on the 
on the student loan payments, sorry, the interest on the student loan payments, yes, uh, that you're making, uh, which will then lower, essentially lower your tax base. So you're paying less taxes. Again, you're saving money uh, that, that in which you can invest somewhere else. Um, if you need to, you can apply for loan forgiveness. Uh, that's only for certain industries. If you're working for like government or certain nonprofits, um, and then obviously pay off your student loans and you want to focus in on eliminating one loan at a time. And we're going to go into more of that in a second. I'm going to try to leave 15 minutes for questions. All right. Credit card debt really quickly. Um, let's look at this, this infographic on the left here. Um, credit card is credit card debt is a dangerous. <laughs> so do not get in that trap. Uh, if you are in that trap, there are different kind of methodologies in terms of being able to pay it off. One is uh, uh, debt snow, snowball, the snowball method. The snowball method is essentially choosing um, the loan, choosing the loan with the least amount of uh, value, right? Or so if I have five credit cards and the lowest one is a thousand dollars, I'm going to start with that one. It makes me feel good when I pay it off. Um, and then I'm going to start on the second one, right? So you're going to pay the minimum on all the others. Um, and I'm gonna work on the one with the least amount or the, the smallest balance. Another way to approach this is what we call debt avalanche method. And that's where you're, you, you, know, you are looking at, you're paying off the credit card with the highest interest rate, right? So those are two different ways in which you can approach that. Um, you can also consider credit card consolidation. This is something that I did years ago um, where I had multiple credit cards um, and I consolidated all of my debt um, through taking out a personal loan, which then allowed me to have, which allowed me to save money and to lower my monthly payments that I was making towards paying off debt. Uh, but let's look at this here, right? So what we don't wanna do is really pay that minimum, just the minimum. Um, uh, do, so essentially every single credit card that you have is gonna be a minimum that a minimum amount, amount due every single month. So what we don't wanna do is just pay that minimum because it's gonna take us years to be able to pay it off. So let's say you have a credit card balance of 5,000, the minimum payment due is 2% of the balance owed and the interest rate is 17%. If you just pay the minimum, it's gonna take you 30 years to pay that off. And you're essentially paying $10,000 in interest over the, life of, uh, over the life of being able to pay that off. If you just increase it by 4%, it's gonna take you 10 years versus three 30 years to pay off that $5,000 you're paying um, about $2,600 in terms of interest. Um, if you pay 6%, um, you're gonna pay it off in 6.8 years and you're only paying $1,500 um, in interest, right? So just paying the minimum balance is a little dangerous. Uh, one, it'll take you a very long time to pay your, your debt off. Um, and then two, you're paying a lot more in interest. So even if you can just go up to the 4%, that cuts your interest payments um, yeah, not only in half, but you know, you're, you're paying almost like a third uh, in terms of interest there. Um, I had a lot of content here. All right, uh, <laughs> so your credit score, it's also really important when you guys are like looking to buy a home, looking to you know, finance a car and, and some other things that are gonna be uh, important as you kind of you know, over the next 20, 30 years. Um, your credit score is really important, right? So 35% of that is made, uh, is determined by your payment history that's paying your debt on time, right? Um, so make sure you're paying your credit card debt on time or any other loans that you have. 30% of your credit score is the amount owed, right? So if I have $10,000 of credit made available to me, um, but you know, I only have a balance of a thousand dollars. That's pretty decent, right? So what you want to do is you want to have, you don't want to have more than thirty percent. You don't want to use more than thirty percent of what's made available to you, right? So if you have ten thousand dollars of credit made available to you, you don't want to use more than three thousand dollars of that, right? Another fifteen percent of your credit score is determined by the length of your credit history. Um, so if you had a credit card since you were 18 years old, you don't want to cancel that card because if you do that, is it essentially cancels out your credit history with that card, right? Um, so you want to, um, you know, uh, be able to manage your your credit cards, you know, effect, effectively, efficiently. Um, and one way to be able to do that is by not canceling those cards that you've had, the, the cards that you've had for the longest, because you want to have 
uh, substantial credit history because that makes up 15%. So any new credit, so anytime that you apply for a new credit, a new credit card, a new loan, uh, your credit will take a hit. Um, and that makes up about 10% of your credit score. So if you're applying for a loan or a credit card, you want to do it within a two week time frame. Um, so if you don't do it within a two week time frame, your, your credit will take a hit. If, if you do it within a two week time frame, your credit will take a hit once. And then let's say another, let's say the third week you, you decide to apply for more credit, um, your credit will take another ding essentially, right? So if you're applying for credit, you definitely want to do it within a two week time window. Um, and then lastly, your credit mix, uh, that's the different types of loans that you have from uh, revolving loans like credit cards to what we call term loans. Uh, that's like your student loans, mortgages, car payments, et cetera. Lenders wanna see that you have a mix of both of those, right? I would also say check your credit reports at least on an annual basis. You can go on annualcreditreport.com um, and you can pull your credit reports from the three credit bureaus to see if, um, yeah, there are any errors on your credit. There's a lot of shadiness going on these days in terms of uh, identity theft, et cetera. Um, so you want to protect your credit because you, you need to be able to leverage it you know, for many things, whether it's employment or uh, buying a home, buying a car, et cetera. All right, and lastly, so risk comes from not knowing what you are doing, Warren Buffett, right? So the fourth habit that you wanna build is really protecting your assets, protecting what you're building, right? So you're gonna invest in financial education. Um, I know this is just a really quick talk here. Uh, you're gonna get a financial advisor. There are a ton of uh, free uh, support that you can get in your cities. Um, in New York, uh, they have um, financial advisors that you can meet with at no cost to help you with budgeting, to help you with savings, et cetera. Um, you want to diversify your assets, meaning, you know, once you start saving, you start investing. One way to protect your assets is to diversify, right? So you don't want to have all of your eggs into one basket. Um, so I would talk to your financial professional who can really help you to figure out how to diversify your assets. So maybe you have some of your stocks, for example, in large cap, mid cap, small cap, or maybe some international stocks, a mix of bonds in there, uh, but essentially that reduces your risk some. Um, you also wanna look to your employer sponsored benefits, health, dental, vision, life, and disability insurance. Had a friend who was, um, um, he, he owned a salon um, and he wound up having a stroke at a really early age and was unable to work uh, for years. Um, he unfortunately passed away, but you know uh, he was unable to make income. Um, he did not have disability insurance, and nobody, no young person thinks that something is going to happen to them. Like, I'm going to have a stroke, or, or you know, a heart attack, or whatever, get hit by a car, right? All of these things can happen. I just met a 23 year old. He was in an Uber and had a car accident in an Uber, um, and was unable to walk for a whole year, right? Um, so. You definitely want to get disability insurance if your employer offers it. If not, you still want to uh, get disability insurance, even if your employer doesn't offer it, because you just never know what can happen. You're essentially protecting your assets. You're protecting yourself and your income in the event that something goes wrong. Um, there are other types of insurance from home, car, um, and you also want to protect your family as well uh, with life insurance. Um, as a young person, I would say uh, term life would be best. There are different types of life insurance. Another one is called whole life. We have more time. We can go into all of the different types and what they mean. Um, so lastly, either money, either make your money work for you or you will always have to work for your money, right? So the goal here is by building healthy habits through budgeting, saving, um, through budgeting, saving, and uh, protecting your assets um, and also in investing your assets, um, you will be off to a great start. So with that, I will take any questions. I see a lot of things in the chat. So I'm gonna take a look at the chat. All right. So we got one question here. How do you how to manage investing in stocks while being in banking where we have to follow a certain process of investing in stocks? 
asking this question since you may have experienced that being in, uh, at JP Morgan Chase. Yeah, so when I was at Chase, I actually was not investing uh, in the stock market. I did have my 401k, uh, but I was not investing in the stock market separately, uh, but I was investing in the company's 401k. So I would definitely start there. I think each company is a little bit different. So depending on what the bank is and then what their policy is, you know, you want to find what find out what that is. And then from there, you can make uh, the right choice. Can you suggest what can be some ways to generate additional income to pay off debt faster? Um, this is the internet age. Um, it, there are so many ways to make money these days, um, whether you are starting a blog and creating content um and you know driving traffic to uh to a blog for example right so you have an expertise in a certain thing uh, you're driving traffic to that blog and you you know you have ads on your website for example to be able to make additional money um, you could you know again leverage your current skill set maybe create an ebook you can put it on etsy or amazon and have people pay you for that even if it's an ebook for five dollars um, investing in the stock market is another great way to make money. Um, there are a million different ways, <laughs> but those are some of the easy ways that, that I know of, right? So either uh, uh, creating some type of content um, and then leveraging that content and selling that content to be able to make additional dollars. Um, I didn't know I could get short-term disability with my pregnancy. If they, if they hadn't told me, I would have never even known I could do that. Absolutely. Um, so definitely getting short term disability insurance uh, while you're pregnant, or just period, like I said earlier, is important because you just never know what could happen. Um, and this was a temporary higher minimum wage. I thought only salary jobs and benefits like that. Awesome. You guys have any other questions? Those are great questions. I hope that was helpful. Um, but the goal really is all about developing great and healthy habits, right? So again, the, our habits determine our future. Um, so, you know, again, start saving as early as possible. Definitely implement a budget, find ways to cut your expenses, protect your assets through education, uh, getting advice, getting insurance, uh, taking advantage of your employer's uh, benefit package, et cetera. So for me, I would say, you know, if I had to start all over again, I would have started saving a lot earlier, right? I was, even when I did graduate from college, um, you know, I, I felt like I was free um, and I had money, you know, I had a lot of money. Um, so I was taking my friends out for drinks and to eat and, you know, going on vacations and doing all types of crazy stuff as a 22 year old. Uh, but if I had to kind of uh, do things differently, um, I would have definitely cre uh, started some uh, automatic savings and started saving a lot earlier. Um, so if you don't take anything away, I would say budgeting and saving are the two most, one of the two most important things that you can start doing. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Any other questions? Laura, I had a quick question. I know you mentioned earlier about um, you know, online banks, they have higher saving rates and interest rates. Uh, do you recommend the same thing for credit cards? Let's say, for example, um, if they offer a bonus and using that, or you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so a credit card is a great website called bankrate.com where you can check out um, various credit cards and their benefits to kind of see which one might be the best one for you. That's where I normally go to check out credit cards. Um, there are a lot of different variables from you know, you want to see if like what the interest rate is, you want to look at if there's a annual fee with the credit card as well. Um, but, you, you know, I, I think choosing a car that offers some types, some type of benefit is really great, whether you're getting points that you can use to get cash back, or that you can use points for travel, um, etc. I would definitely go that route, unless, you know, uh, uh, unless there's um, um, some type of uh, you know, uh, annual fee attached to that card. I would stay away from annual fees. Thanks. Awesome, Diana just opened up Mint. 
and she's shocked at her spending habits. I will definitely use it now for budgeting. <laughs> yeah, I go and I'm like, wait, I spend way too much on eating out this month. And then from there, you know, the data allows you to make more informed decisions. It allows you to um, say, hey, I need to cut back. I need to set a boundary here because I'm spending too much on one thing over the other, right? So having access to that data, a dashboard that's easy to, easy to read is really, really great. Credit card. Uh, credit balance cards. Um, can you speak a little bit more to that, Natasha? Are you talking about transferring balances from one card to another? Got it. Yeah. So if you want to transfer, yeah, I think that's a great thing to do. Um, so you can transfer or consult, I would say either a personal loan, you know, you can look at your credit union. If you're not a part of a credit union, I would say become a part of a credit union um, and take out a personal loan that can then lower your interest rate for credit cards so that you have a lower monthly payment. Uh, but if that's not an option for whatever reason and you're going to go the credit card route, um, you want to get a 0% interest on the credit card uh, where you're transferring that balance. Uh, but most of them have um, a balance trans transfer fee. So you want to identify and see what that balance transfer fee is before you move any um, any debt from one card to the next, because it may not be worth it with, um, you know, uh, that fee that that's attached. So again, go on bankrate.com um, and you can look at various cards that allow you to do the balance transfers, but definitely pay attention to um, the fees that they're charging. Um, and then also how long the introductory uh, interest rate is for the balance transfer. Um, so you definitely want to go with a 0% interest uh, fee, I'm sorry, 0% inter uh, interest for a certain period of time, at least a year. Um, and then make sure that the fee is minimal. And you can do the comparison again on bankrate.com. These are great questions. Awesome. It's one o'clock. Um, I don't have anything else unless you guys do. Um, Alexandra or Valerie. Yes, Lloyd, thank you for your presentation. This concludes today's professional development series. Please consider joining us for our next talk on August 31st with Laurel Brown from Google as she discusses exploring non-traditional jobs for engineering grads. We thank you all for your participation and hope you have a wonderful day. Have a great day.